and I'm hoping today to take you around my pond, show you some of the things that live in it and some of the things that live around it. So, first of all, what do I need? I need some equipment in order to take you down below the surface and show you what's there. So, I will show you what I need. A pair of wellies, a white tray and a net. The pond, as you can see, is quite large. It attracts all sorts of wildlife, moorhens, toads, newts, frogs and even grass snakes. And this morning I saw a thrush catching worms along the damp mud at the edge. There's also a lot of plants around it and some of those have flowers that attract, attract the bees. So I have bees, butterflies and at night time the bats fly around catching the insects. So my catch this morning was quite good, I was really pleased. I got out a lot of weed, which is where a lot of the invertebrates hide. And I hope you can see, if I just use my trusty spoon to move the weed aside, that hidden away amongst the weeds and reeds of my pond are dragons. But instead of breathing fire, they breathe in the water. And this is actually a nymph or a juvenile stage of a dragonfly. <coughs> they live for about three years under the water and during that time they feed on all the little insects, other insects, larvae and um, little worms and whatever they can catch basically. He's quite still at the moment because he doesn't really like being out in the in the pond, out of the pond I should say. Let's see if we can make him walk a little. I don't want to disturb him too much. There we are. At least that shows that he's alive and well. He's going to stay there, as I say, for about three years and then he'll crawl out onto a stem, crawl up the stem into the air, dry out a bit and then eventually his skin will split and over a few hours the adult's going to emerge. We call them nymphs instead of larvae because they grow gradually, whereas a larva, like a butterfly larva, i.e. a caterpillar, undergoes a sudden metamorphosis and changes quickly. This is another, another nymph, not a larva, and this time we're looking at, instead of a dragonfly, a damselfly. So a much finer, slimmer animal, and this one has three tails shaped rather like a goose's feather. And right next to him you can see one of these little worms I was talking about and that's actually the larva of a biting midge and these make great food for all sorts of animals in the pond. There he comes back again and then just down here was my other find of the morning which if I can find him there we go Is, an, is a the larva, the tadpole, of a newt. So it's a newt pole. There he is, and if you look really carefully, you might be able to see his gills, because he has gills to begin with. And of course, when he comes out of the water, he's going to turn into a, an adult. Those gills are going to be absorbed and his legs will grow. There are plenty of other things in the pond as well. And I don't know how many of these you can see, but there, there's, there's, there's one going across. All sorts of larvae, more difficult to identify and better put under a microscope or, a, or a, um, even a magnifying glass will help hugely. But perhaps you can see all the little tiny moving dots in the water. And those are things like water fleas, daphnia and, and um, little other crustaceans. And also some beetles, little swimming beetles. I had hoped to get a water boat moment, I don't think I managed that today. Yes I did, there he is, a little tiny one. Some of these are called upside down swimmers because they swim on their back and some species swim on their front. And there's the moorhen. 
she doesn't come out very much at the moment she's sitting on her nest keeping her eggs warm just comes out for occasional feed and I'm so glad we saw her and I hope you've enjoyed your visit to my wildlife pond as much as I do goodbye Okay, and I'm joined live by Francis Stepper. We tried to do the interview earlier, but I don't think it actually streamed, so we're just going to try doing it again. I hope that's okay with you, Francis. Yes, okay, yes. that's fine. Okay, um, and you're a bit more prepared this time for, for uh, some of the clips I've got to show you, some of the things I've been finding in my garden pond. It'd be really great right. to get some, some uh, uh, of what, a uh, bit more information about what the kind of things I've been finding. So I'm just going to put this. That would be lovely. This, Right, so who do we have there? A little back swimmer or a water boatman? I'm not sure which. Oh, there, oh, now that's very interesting. That looks, that one looks like a caddis fly very quickly. See, ah. this is, I think this is a flatworm. You see how smoothly it glides across the bottom yeah. and the shape of the head. So I'm certain that's what's called a flatworm, a different group from normal worms. So that's very interesting find, yes. I think you have a very rich pond and little Daphne or water fleas. Lots of food they are for all sorts of animals. But great to see a lot of those. In fact, the water's full of them, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of buzzing with them, I think. Yes, it is. And now you've got your ram's horn snail shell. That, that's a beautiful shell. And um, later, if we have time, I'll show you one of mine as well. Oh, his, head, his head's coming out. He's looking <laughs> around looking for food. You can see the tentacles on the head and the shape of the of the shell. Yep, there's an, that's another one, I think. Oh, and there's a little um, water skater on the surface just disappeared as well. So you have a lot of life in your pond, Ross. And a little tadpole or newt pole. And he might well, when he's a bit older, he might well try eating some of those little crustaceans you can see swimming around him at the moment. <laughs> oh yes, yes. He's a, a common, I would think he's a common newt larva, a common newt pole. Yeah. And this this is lovely. This is a little bivalve shell, um, two, i.e. a shell that has two, sh two halves to it. And that's um, sometimes called, there's, there's a pea mussel and there's a, um, an orb cockle. So like mussels and cockles on the beach. Only I don't think they're particularly closely related. Very small, hence the name pea mussel, I suppose. That's, that's lovely. Okay. Well, thank you. for. I've been uh, doing a bit of pond dipping today as well. and just got a couple of things I thought I could show you. Oh, this one's moving really, really quickly. But uh, because... I've been very pleased by how many newts we've had in our garden ponds. Oh, here yes, here. yes, I can little... see him very clearly. Yeah. Oh, and you can, see his, you can see his little feathery gills, can't you, sticking up just behind his head. Yeah. So he can breathe, and breathe in the water. Yeah, because this one's those got. Have yeah, yeah, this one's got its four legs already, and um, sort of very. Tiny it? Oh, hands. lovely. Yeah, very. Yeah, very so it's nearly, nearly ready, nearly ready to come out. And then here, the next one? this one, a bit fast moving, see if I can... Oh, yes, very in. quickly. Yeah, there, I can see that quite clearly. That's a diving beetle. Diving um, beetle. I don't know which species. It might be a great diving beetle if he's big enough. It's about um, a centimetre long, I'd say. It's that kind of oh, yes, I think really could easily be a great diving beetle. Yeah. And they have very ferocious larvae, actually, with really? big jaws. So... Um, so they don't come out of the pond, but they change from a larva to an adult in the pond. Yeah. So yes, he's a great friend as well. <laughs> yeah. And uh, let's see. Six I legs for an insect. <laughs> and, and one thing. Yeah. Oh, I think I've got a slightly bigger. It's a bit cloudy, but I think there's a slightly bigger newt in here. Just in there, I can see its right. tail, but it's a little bit cloudy for us to be able to see it. Um, right. Right. And I do have some more. You seem to have a lot of the the ram's horn snails. Yes. There he you is, said, crawling up the side. Yeah. yeah. You said there are quite a few other species of snail. 
that you get in, in yes, there, there are. I have some shells which I can show you in a, if you'd like me to. Yes, that'd be fantastic. Shall I try that now? Yeah. Okay, well, this one you've already shown us, so that, that's the ram-thorn snail. Um, and again, if, um, if your listeners are wondering why they're called that, it's because it's shaped like a ram, like a sheep, um, a male sheep's horns. And they often have these yeah. lovely curly horns. That's quite a big one that I found on the banks at Wiccan Fen after they've been dredging out one of the, the little um, streams and things there. So that, that's a ram's horn. This one, let's try again. This one is the great pond snail because it's so large. You can see that you very just, large opening. You just move it to the, like your left a little bit. That's it. Perfect. So my, like that. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's perhaps one of the biggest that you might find. And it would have to be a lovely pond to find one of those. And then the eared snail, so called because you can see how big that opening is and it's shaped just a little bit like a human ear so that's called the eared snail and there's many yeah. others as well and i wonder if um again i wonder if your listeners if they've ever found one of these or you um empty and you feel how very light it is um, yeah. and and yet a, a similar sized seashell will be much heavier and the reason is that in fresh water there's much less calcium for them yeah. to make their shells from, yeah. so you'd never be able to get you'd never be able to get a giant clam or something like that a, a meter across in fresh water because there simply wouldn't be enough material for them to make their shells. Right, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I was wondering why the snail shells felt so light. Actually, that's that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So we had a question from Alex, age eleven. Why are fresh air fresh water areas so important for the environment? Well, uh, that's a very good question, Alec. Um, they're important for many reasons, but the reason that, that I always think of is because they, they are a food store, if you like, for a great many other animals. So they're a food store in terms of all the little larvae and the insects that live in there are food for frogs, for toads, for newts, um, and for many other birds and things as well. Um, I saw a thrush fishing right at the edge of the pond, or he was probably looking for worms, but he might well have found something in the pond as well. And um, some of the, the insect larvae turn into adults, which then fly around your garden or um, the general countryside. And of course, they're very important as pollinators, or in the case of things like large dragonflies, they eat some of the pests in your garden. Because they're, very, they're quite ferocious, they can catch quite large flying insects. So that would be certainly one reason, but there's many other reasons, and I, I just think it's um, it it increases the biodiversity. And biodiversity means lots of different sorts of plants and animals, which is very important. Fantastic. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that is brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us again. I'm just going to finish off today with a short uh, film of uh, some of the stars of the Pond Watch. Uh, little film that I've been putting together for our blog, which is our newts. So I'm just going to show you a few of our newts, the adults as well as the new poles. But thank you so much, Francis, for that. And we'll see you again soon. You're welcome. This was my first glimpse of a newt this year. Missed it? Let's watch it again in slow motion. Keep an eye on the far left of the screen. There. It has been fascinating watching the newts interact with each other. Here we have a larger female and a spotty male with that crest along its back. The male's following the female. She doesn't seem so pleased about it. Not one, but two more newts have joined the picture. One's wandered off. A gulp of air and another's on its way. A 
new favourite spot for the newt seems to be under the leaves of the water lily. Just watch where this newt goes. Again, it's not alone. Three newts. Here I have an old white enamel tray, which makes it easier for me to see what's in the water. Spotted a baby newt yet? There are three of them here. A bit of a closer look, and you can see that they have their four legs already. Like frogs and toads, newts hatch out without any legs, but unlike frogs and toads, it is the front legs that develop first in newts. You can see the external gills really clearly here. They are the feathery, branching structures just behind the head. These are used by our baby newts to breathe. Gills work by providing a really big surface area, over which oxygen can be absorbed from the water into the newt's bloodstream. They only work in water. As soon as you get out on land, all those fine filaments stick together. Later in the summer, these newts will lose their gills and will be able to leave the pond, breathing in air using their lungs instead. Okay, well thank you and again apologies for some of the little technical difficulties we had today. I had one more question uh, which was from Zoe, age 7. Baby newts seem to be called newt poles. Why aren't baby frogs referred to as frog poles? That is a really good question. We actually tend to refer to all of them as tadpoles. And then, um, but I think Newt Pole is just a really great name for them. Um, so that's all we've got time for for this session. But do come back at three o'clock this afternoon, where we will be talking wildlife filmmaking with Ellie Bladen. We'll also be showing some of your makes and your sightings as well. So really excited. There's some really, really wonderful things that you've sent in. And then we'll be uh, drawing the whole of Zoology Live to a close at four o'clock today with our Zoology Live quiz. So we look forward to seeing you later.